Thank you very much. <clears throat> Dr. Atik Rahman, the chair of this concluding session, also wish to acknowledge uh, VC, Mr. Uh, Omar Rahman, for uh, welcoming us all today. And he has been, I know, a very strong and a very powerful advocate of this whole agenda. We have a, a very distinguished line of panelists. And uh, I would like to thank Dr. Atik and uh, Dr. Salimul Haq for the very strategic choice of the panelists, because they have here the Secretary of the Ministry of Environment, who is the top bureaucrat as far as the ministry is concerned that responds to climate change. And we also have the individual that you have just heard, Dr. Shamsul Halam, who is, as we say, uh, the brains behind the planning process in the country. So you have the planning side, you also have the implementation side, and I think they've done that very well. And of course, all of you, a very good afternoon. Um, I was mentioning to uh, Dr. Salim that uh, we actually didn't need to have this session. I had the privilege of coming to the uh, fag end of the interactive session that you were having, and I thought that was the perfect roundup because you thanked all the individuals, you know, you had a very lively interactive session. So this is really more of an addition, maybe to satisfy a few of us so that we can carry the label of being honorable guests and chief guests but wasn't really necessary. Uh, let me also, if I may, go back to the last session that was, I think, Pablo and uh, Bettina you were conducting. And I was very taken by the three questions that you put. The first one was, what is it that we liked about these uh, few days? And of course, having been present for 15 minutes, I cannot even try to capture what went on for seven days. Uh, but I reflected on that as we had tea. Uh, again, in the very comfortable surroundings of the cafeteria. And what I liked was the spirit of togetherness. I think that is what I liked in the very short time that I was there. What I would wish for is whether we can apply this spirit of togetherness to respond to a whole list of global challenges, including climate change, that we face. And what I wonder, why aren't we doing enough of it? Why is it taking us so long? to wake up. Um, and I think that takes me to the, to the hub of the issue, which is how do we take forward uh, the outcome that you have crafted and generated over the last few days. One is, of course, that the government and the planning process pick it up, uh, which is very important. Uh, but also, I think what is important to recognize and understand and I'm not going to make this a long speech because I know you have been at this for the last seven days. And I certainly don't want to test your um, ability to adapt to listen to long speeches. So I think there are just a few thoughts that I, that I want to share. The first point is we, of course, cannot go on adapting forever. There are natural limits to adaptation. And to think that we can go on adapting forever is certainly not going to work. So at the end of the day, mitigation is the best form of adaptation. So all of the things that we do, yes, we are trying to solve the problem. Yes, we are excited about the Paris process. We have a distinguished representative from the UNFCCC. But it doesn't go far enough. It's not good enough to achieve the 1.5 or the 2 degrees rise in temperature. If you look at the best projections, the best case scenarios, you're looking at close to three degrees Celsius. So Christina Figueroa has rightly mentioned the amount of discomfort and the suffering that's going to be caused even by 1.5 degrees Celsius. But unless we really rev up the ambition levels, uh, this is going to be a very, very torrid process of adaptation because we are now closer to three and we need to do a lot more work to come to two or one and a half. So I think that is something very, very important. The other point which struck me about this is the use of the word resilience. Uh, resilience, I at least, I am familiar with it more in the context of risk reduction. We have not heard this so much in the climate change discourse. And I think that leads me to the other point that I would like to make. It is how can we bring about a convergence in terms of disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. To me, there are plenty of reasons for us to pursue that convergence. Of course, you need to have the conceptual coherence first. 
If you were to draw two circles, one indicating climate change adaptation and the other disaster risk reduction, you will see that there is a great degree of overlap between the two. The same constituency, the same response, the challenge of climate change. And if we can have a degree of convergence, I think you're going to avoid fragmentation. There'll be a more efficient use of resources. And at the end of the day, a more efficient delivery mechanism that we can apply for both. So maybe the takeout from CBA 10 is going to be how do we in future facilitate or arrange a marriage between climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. Of course, the fundamental challenges still remain. Uh, CBA 1, I mean, I was just watching the video, was trying to make the, uh, connect the dots between climate change, development, and poverty. So those underlying challenges are still going to remain. But I think we as governments, as uh, parliaments, and also you as uh, the community of uh, uh, adaptation, you have to think how we can integrate and how we can bring the two processes together. I think that's going to be absolutely fundamental. We have a representative from UNFCCC. You know, this challenge of integration uh, goes to the heart of global governance. If you look at the UN system, UNFCCC, you have UNEP, you have the Food and Agriculture Organization, you have ECOSOC, and the integration is not there within governments. Even within the Ministry of Environment, we still work in silos. So how do we come out of silos? How do we avoid the overlapping? And how do we have horizontal integration? I think that in global governance, in national governance, and even at the local government governance is going to be absolutely fundamental. Because unless you have that integration, you are not going to be using your resources efficiently. And we know that whatever we spend today in climate change adaptation or risk reduction is always going to be less than what we spend tomorrow. So there you have the basic challenge. If you look at the two in terms of ratios, on the one hand you have the cost of inaction, and on the other, you have the benefit of action. So this is the smartest investment that we can make in climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. So we need to come out of that silo approach. And when we talk of resilience, and Dr. Shamsul Alam touched on this, essentially three components. Component one, our ability to absorb the shock, our preparedness, our readiness to absorb the initial shock the impact. Number two, how do we bounce back from that? And number three is when we bounce back, do we bounce back at a higher level of preparedness, whether it is through Build Back Better or any other means? So that again, that simple term of resilience is actually going to bring these two agendas together. And I think that is absolutely fundamental as we go forward. Uh, the other challenge I think we have when it comes to adaptation is it's a very dynamic scenario. The goalpost is constantly changing. We know that we will be challenged. We will be tested in terms of our resolve, in terms of our creativity, and in terms of our compassion to respond to climate change. We know that more intense events are going to happen with increasing frequency. I was uh, reading about the drought in our neighboring country, India. The worst in 50 years. 300 million people affected. Hospitals where doctors don't have water to wash their hands. Nine million farmers don't have water. You're having to transport that through a train system. And these events are going to happen more often. So one of the challenges is going to be not just the number of responses, in terms of adaptation, but the quality of responses. So it's going to be from a quantitative approach to a qualitative response. Because each time, the impact is going to be at a higher level. So in a way, if I can use that example, it's like transitioning from the MDGs to the Sustainable Development Goals. The MDGs were more quantitative, SDGs are more qualitative. So most of the low-hanging fruits we have already eaten up or picked from the tree in terms of adaptation. So we now have to reach up to the higher branches. That's going to be the qualitative test. And to what extent 
do we then use the community response to in fact pass that test? I think this is going to be something which is very critical. The other point which I just wish to flag, governance. And of course, as a parliamentarian, that's something which is very dear to me. So what is governance? You know, like resilience, we try to describe. And to me, in very simple terms, it's what we do, how we decide what we do, and thirdly, how do we do, or how do we do better what we do? That is really governance. And the impacts of governance can be manifold if we can get the governance right. That, of course, takes you to the whole issue of capacity of local government bodies. Do they have the funding? Do they have the independence? Where do you draw the line in the sand between how MPs, let's say in the context of Bangladesh, get involved in local government work? Where do you draw that line? You know, where does national parliaments, MPs, how do they work with local government bodies? That's going to be very important. And the other similar relationship is going to be, how do you define the relationship between NGOs, civil society organizations, and the government? Some NGOs do exceptionally good work in terms of promoting concept. So how do you then get local governments to champion these projects, to champion these concepts, and to fund these concepts? So that relationship is a pretty undefined relationship. And I think that's also something that we need to look at very, very carefully. And at the end of the day, of course, it's partnerships. You know, it's the local, the central, the global, it's all coming together in that partnership equation that we all seek. So these are just some of my, my thoughts. I think uh, the idea of a community-based adaptation is something which is absolutely critical and fundamental to our response. The convergence with DRR is, I think, something which is going to become more pronounced, and especially because this is the first year when we have those three UN processes. The Sendai Framework for Risk Reduction, the Sustainable Development Goals, and of course, the Climate Change Accord. And we need to push, not just on adaptation, but also on mitigation, because at the end of the day, that is our best response when it comes to adaptation. Of course, there are issues with regard to funding. There are issues with regard to how do we monitor, how do we report, how do we verify. And especially as the challenges and responses become more qualitative in nature, how do you actually evaluate which is the best option for us to take? But I think what you do is, you present that forum where we can have individuals coming from different countries. The spirit of togetherness. And, um, and this will be my last thought. Because that spirit of togetherness is in very stark contrast to the other narrative that we have in the world today. Are we going to have a nation-state approach? And I was listening to Donald Trump last night and I was very intrigued. Or are we going to have global cooperation? Which is going to be the way forward? The two are, of course, not mutually exclusive. But I think when we talk about 40 uh, countries being represented here, yes, you are here from Barbados, you are here from uh, Asia Pacific, you are here from uh, Latin America, from North America, from Europe, but you are really here as global citizens. And I think it is as global citizens that we need to respond to the global challenges. And this community, this platform, virtual and real, when you get together, is really where you have those ideas. So it's a clearing house of ideas. It's a place for innovation. It's for sharing what works best in your own context. And that is something that I hope you will continue to do. And we as a parliamentary community and governments all over the world will continue to benefit. Till you have your next uh, CBA 11, I wish you all the very best and continued engagement. Thank you very much.